All right. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining today's session. We will be getting started shortly. Um, and just for now, we're going to give everyone a moment to get connected and settled, as we know that it takes a moment or two um, to get to get settled. I do want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, I'm Caitlin Giles McCormick here with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Today's session is the NJEDA Child Care Facilities Improvement Program, specifically with information for New Jersey contractors. So thank you all. Um, a quick housekeeping note, we do suspect, if you can go to the next slide, um, we do suspect that many questions are gonna be answered in today's presentation. However, you are able to write in questions at any point during the presentation using the Zoom's Q&A feature. Um, it should be on your Zoom command options, probably at the bottom of your screen or your phone or however you're joining us. It will allow you to make sure um, we'll be able to get back to you if you put it in that Q&A section. Um, it's a lot easier to kind of keep track of um, that way and so that other people can see your questions and answers as well. We'll also have some other methods of contact that we'll be sharing without it, um, in today's presentation. If you need some really specific information um, and have some specific questions about your own situation. Um, we'll have other ways that we can follow up um, after the presentation, after the webinar. Um, we know that sometimes we're not gonna be able to answer every specific little thing um, that may come up today, but we'll stay in touch. Today's session um, is being recorded and will be posted on the NJEDA and YouTube pages. Um, the slides and other resources are also going to be available after the webinar. Um, and if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, the Department of Labor Commissioner, Robert, Robert Asario Angelo, um, was unfortunately unable to join us today um, live, but he has sent us a quick video um, and wanted to share a few words, and we are going to go ahead and go to that now. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar today. And thank you to our partners at NJEDA for having me here to make a few remarks. The launch of the New Jersey Child Care Facilities Improvement Program is very exciting. I'm glad to see you all here to learn about your roles and responsibilities as potential participants. We appreciate the steps you've taken to invest in your workers and the effort you've shown just by showing up today. Both demonstrate your care and concern for your employees and community. You've proven yourselves as honest and trustworthy employers so I are thrilled to offer you this opportunity. Child care plays an important role in the functioning of our state and everyday life. We saw during the pandemic just how crucial the child care sector is to our workers in the state and for parents being able to participate in the workforce and support their families. Sadly, the child care shortage had a disproportionate impact on women who are still just shy of returning to their pre-COVID numbers in our state's workforce. Governor Murphy has proven his commitment to supporting our child care facilities by dedicating millions of dollars to programs intended to strengthen the child care industry, including nearly $55 million to the Child Care Facilities Improvement Program. These construction projects need the attention and care of responsible contractors, those who employ trained and capable workers and who treat those workers with respect and dignity that they deserve, and of course, in accordance with our state's So I think the end there got a little cut off, um, but greatly appreciate the support and um, from the commissioner and think we're going to have a great session today. And in order to get us started, I am going to shift things over to NJEBA's Executive Vice President of Economic Security, Tara Colton. Tara? Thanks, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Really a pleasure to be with you today. Um, and uh, we have a, a packed agenda and a number of uh, wonderful speakers. You'll be hearing from um, a couple of my esteemed colleagues here at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, as well as our counterparts from the New Jersey Department of Children and Families. So very excited to be um, speaking with you today. Next slide, please. 
just as context um, and, and really uh, thank Commissioner Saro Angelo and the entire team at Department of Labor for their partnership. Um, some of you may be deeply familiar with the New Jersey EDA. Some of you, um, this may be the first time you're hearing of us. So um, we work very closely on behalf of Governor Murphy's commitment to a stronger and fairer New Jersey in partnership with many of our sister agencies in state government to drive the state's economic growth and, um, and really look at what kind of investments need to be made to strengthen New Jersey's economic infrastructure and long-term competitiveness. Next slide, please. I want to emphasize that it's it's meaningful um, on a number of levels that the state's economic agency, the business agency, is making such a substantial investment in improving child care facilities. It uh, really reinforces how child care providers are businesses themselves, even though many of them don't necessarily consider themselves businesses. Um, but also how uh, how vital, as the commissioner said, and, and certainly as the governor and first lady have said, and, and our CEO has emphasized just how essential child care is to the ability of New Jersey's um, economy to, to not just function, but flourish. So we are dedicating a significant amount of resources. Um, we are now at over $90 million, $90 million in funding that is available or will be made available for facility improvements. And so part of why we are so thrilled to speak with all of you today is that um, every penny of that funding needs to be um, uh, for, for facility improvements need to be needs to be spent with a New, Jer New Jersey Department of Labor um, registered public works contractor. So um, it, it was incumbent on us to make sure we got the word out to all of you, but also that you understand more about the program, what's expected and, and what is coming ahead, because um, this is a substantial amount of funding that um, we will be making available and really see you as vital partners with the child care centers that we are working with. So just as quick context, we are making grant funding available. So that means we are giving this money to child care centers for them to spend. They do not pay it back. And the funding is explicitly focused on facility improvements. We're going to get into much more detail about what those entail. Um, the first round of funding that we are making available is up to 25 million of the more than 90 million that we have um, that has been set aside. So part of what we're excited to share um, these details with you is also to hopefully get you excited and interested in what we, um, we know will be a, a long-term program over the next several years. Next slide, please. So uh, we, and we have tremendous detail on this. We um, have a lot of resources on our website, um, which we can um, put the, the link in the, um, the Q&A in the chat for folks to dig into. Um, but essentially, we are funding projects for child care centers. The projects, uh, and we've been using these terms, I know these may or may not align with how you talk about things, but this is the, the language that we've been using. A project is essentially everything the child care center is planning to do at one location with our funding. And then within that total dollar amount, there can be multiple eligible uses. So in this example, the project includes, and this may include, you know, some of the different folks from different parts of the skilled trades. There might be one contractor that would work on window installation and one contractor that is expert in flooring replacement, et cetera. Um, there may be a general contractor, but then any subcontractors also need to be um, on the registered public works contractor list. But so we are looking for child care centers to most importantly, identify improvements, you can go to the next slide, um, that will improve the quality of the environment for the children that they care for, um, to uh, think about the kinds of um, expansion or capacity improvement that they're looking for. Um, we know that in many communities, child care is um, something that parents uh, are desperately looking for in order to have a, a safe, high quality, affordable, um, reliable place to, to, to send their children. And um, many of these providers are interested in expanding or converting existing space, but they don't they don't have that um, funding to do so. And so that's part of what our, our resources can pay for. We, we cannot pay for new construction or significant expansion, but we can pay for conversion within existing space. Um, a lot of what we also hear from childcare providers is the importance of improving access 
um, and egress to the outdoors in particular. Um, you know, many children in one of those giant strollers with, you know, 10 children strapped into it going up a ramp. Um, if that ramp doesn't exist or there's only stairs, that really inhibits the ability of those children and those caregivers to go outside or access other parts of the facility. And then um, we have a very exhaustive list of what is an eligible um, interior facility improvement. Next slide, please. On a companion note, we also, um, our funds can be used for exterior improvements. So um, given the focus on child care, there are you know, um, certainly some specific parameters that child care providers, child care centers uh, would be um, interested in that other small businesses perhaps might not, but certainly around outdoor yeah. play space, play areas, playgrounds, et cetera. Um, as well as the outdoor um, environment that the children and, and, and staff and, and caregivers encounter. So um, thinking about the, the, the deck, the, you know, the, the, um, the ground that they're walking on, the connectivity between, um, between sorry, I saw a question, are you muted? Yes, this is, uh, this is not something where you'll be able to um, just verbally ask a question. If you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A, please. You can type it into the Q&A, please. Um, we, uh, so we, we have the ability for providers to identify what some of their higher need um, projects are, their uses, and then propose those to us. We also, again, um, looking at accessibility, exterior drainage. So we have looked at um, a lot of the research around best practices for high quality childhood environments and really are, are getting into what are the kinds of investments and improvements that child care centers feel they need to make. Next slide, please. So this is um, a snapshot of the kinds of um, expenses that our grants can be used to cover. So again, our funding will be provided to child care centers. That means a, a center has to serve at least uh, six or more children and, and meet a number of eligibility criteria um, that, uh, that are laid out in our program model. But um, we importantly, and I you know my colleagues are going to get into this in more detail, um, I imagine for, for most of you, what you're most interested in is this far left, which is around the hard costs. And so our funding um, can be used for hard costs, soft costs, and ff &E. Providers do not have to apply for all of it, but essentially they need to to identify a number of eligible uses and then roll that up into what um, they are proposing as their project. Um, there is a, a mechanism that we are developing um, around how the funding will be dispersed to the registered, um, the public works registered contractor. Um, we can go into that in more detail, but you know we have, in uh, many regards, tried to really harness the expertise of certainly our colleagues here at the EDA and at our sister agencies, but also recognize that. The goal of this program is to improve the quality of the child care centers that are the youngest New Jerseyans spend time in. It's also to make those centers more financially sustainable and improve their revenue prospects. It's to um, you know, improve the environment that these kids are in because there's so much research about the impact of natural light and access to outdoor space and all of these best practices. The goal of this program is not to make child care providers become experts in prevailing wage monitoring and window installation and um, <laughs> all of the intricacies that have to have to happen, but we are not going to solely put that on the shoulders of the child care providers because we know that um, they need to be focused on caring for children and running their business. Next slide, please, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to one of my colleagues. So just as a, um, a snapshot, and we, again, we have a lot more resources online with much more detail, but the funding that we are making available will be grants to um, individual child care centers that will total between 50 and $200,000. This is only for future improvements. So it is not for anything that the center has already done. If you've already done a job for a center, we can't pay you back. We can't pay them back for it. It has to be um, in the future and after our funding is approved. Importantly, the funding that we are providing has to cover the full cost. So if the child care center has a number of projects and eligible uses that they want to pursue, but the, the total cost of those exceeds what we have available, um, it needs to be adjusted so that it would fit within our limits. As I said, we can use, uh, providers can use a portion up to 20% of the funding for soft costs. Um, we are also building in up to 15% for unanticipated cost overruns. 
importantly, um, the, the work is subject to prevailing wage and affirmative action, labor compliance monitoring. My colleagues go into much more detail there. Um, the timeline is that the project needs to start within one year of the grant being awarded to the child care center. And then it needs to be completed within one year of, um, of the, the start of construction. Crucially, all, um, all quotes and the work uh, that's done needs to be done by one of our um, incredible contractors on the registered contractors list. Um, and then the last things I would just highlight here before um, I turn it over to my colleague is, again, the, the total cost for everything that child care centers want to do needs to be at least $50,000. It all has to be for the future, so we cannot reimburse or look retrospectively before this program. Um, it can't be used with other funding, and we have some details on that. And then one nuance that's just important for child care centers is that there's often talk about limited um, spaces available for infants and toddlers, essentially children under two and a half. And um, so our funding cannot be used to essentially convert a space that's serving those children and replace it with space that will serve older children, because that would just worsen the, um, the limited availability of those spaces. So with that, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Kathleen Agason, who is the program manager for our HUD programs here at the New Jersey EDA and a, a real expert on, um, on the operations and has been such a partner with us in scoping this out. So um, we'll turn it over to Kathleen. And um, again, if you have questions, please uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. Hello, everyone. Um... My name is Kathleen Agason, as, as Tara mentioned, and just a little background on myself. I've been with the EDA for approximately uh, nine years. And for most of those years, I've been working with uh, contractors, municipalities, hospitals, and small businesses to assist them on um, projects that involve federal funds, which is the case here with the child care centers. I'll be walking you through some um, requirements, compliance issues, and contract requirements. Next slide, Emily. Um, the most important point I want to make today is um, regards, <clears throat> excuse me, um, your the, necess the necessity for you to have a public, a New Jersey Public Works certificate. And if I take a step back a minute, when the child care provider submits an application to uh, apply for these funds, they will be submitting that with your, with the contractor's cost proposal and with the verification of eligibility. The first thing that will happen is we're going to do a cost reasonable check on the cost proposal. And then we will be going through a process whereby we check to make sure you are not on a debarred list for either the state or the federal government. And the requirements are that you have a New Jersey Public Works registration, that it's current, you have a New Jersey business registration, and if you have any SWIMBY certificates that have been issued by the treasury, um, meaning you are a small business, a woman owned, a minority business, you will submit those to your child care uh, facility with the verification of eligibility form. And at that point, we'll be doing a debarment check. And also something very key to the debarment check as of um, earlier this year, federal. Uh, contractors that wish to apply or will be reimbursed for work with federal money must be registered at SAM.gov. If you are already registered at SAM.gov and you have a unique identity, that's great, but you need to go through and check it to make sure that you are registered um, for financial assistance and that that registration is public. And I really hope that um, everyone does this soon if you anticipate being a part of this program. Next slide. These are all um, documents that will be required to be attached to your contract. 
And this is also something that we will be going through with the child care providers so that they have all the information about what needs to be attached to each and every contract. Uh, if you're a GC, you'll need to have it attached to your contract and you will need to attach it to your subcontracts. Um, the compliance provisions just um, talk about things like EE, -E or equal employment, affirmative action, uh, breach of contract. Um, and all of these documents will eventually make it up to our website. Some of them may already be there. Um, general conditions are recommendations for good practices. Uh, talks about things if you know, you're changing the price or work of a contract, it will require a change order. Um, the cost breakdown of the project. If you're doing windows and sheetrock and plumbing, we need to see it. You know, um, eight windows, the number of square feet of the sheetrock and how much it's going to cost to install um, each of those square feet. The Swimby utilization form will let you tell us whether or not you and or any of your subs are or hold certificates for small women, minority, disabled um, through the treasury. And then of course the drug-free workplace certificate and anti-lobbying. Those are all just attachments that will be required on your contract. There's also gonna be some labor attachments um, and Lorena will talk to you in uh, greater detail on those following my presentation. So these are all the requirements that will be attached to your contracts with your child care provider, and you will need to attach to your subcontracts with anyone that works on this job for you. Um, next slide. I'm not sure if we have any architects or engineers on the call today, but um, if we do, you will also have contract requirements, which are mostly the same, um, except for when it comes to prevailing wage, which again, Lorena could also speak to. Next slide. So once the application has been approved, um, we will we will be in contact with you and the child care provider to arrange a pre-construction meeting um, to go over, you know, just to, to get a baseline for real, where we will be going with the project. The, these are the requirements and these will all be discussed in further detail at a meeting, an in-person meeting. They'll, we'll need to have a written notice to proceed from the child care provider to the contractor. It'll need to specify, you know, the day to start, the expected time frame of the project. Um, we'll need, the EDA will be required to collect copies of any permits, local permits and approvals that are required to complete the work on the job, on the, on the project. If it looks like you're not going to meet um, or if you're getting behind, we will ask you to update your project schedule. Um, and then of course, we'll talk about contractor requisitions, which is where you will request a payment. And we'll go over those in greater detail. Of note is you, you should know that there'll be 10% retainage held on each payment application. Um, we will require change orders and we'll, we'll want to just look at them before they are approved by the child care center to make sure they were, are related to project scope. The next item, the SWIMBY monthly activity report is, uh, will be required to be submitted with each payment request. And it's just where you're gonna let us know how much of a contract or of your subcontractors work is being handled by a business that is considered small, women, minority owned, et cetera. 
We'll do photo verification of, we'll ask for photo verification of completed work in most instances. Sometimes we might do an on site verification depending on the, the duration of the project. If there will be multiple payment applications, we will need a, le a lien release after each payment application. And then of course we have punch list. Um, if a punch list is necessary, we'll, we'll need to see a copy of it and uh, we'll need to follow up to make sure everything on that punch list is resolved. Next slide, please. And then at, at the end of the project, there'll be some closeout requirements and that's mostly um, we need, if an electrical permit, we'll need to see a copy that the town has signed off, any framing works, we'll need sign offs. So we'll need all those, those permit approvals. If there are any, uh, is, if there's any work that involves warranties and guarantees, we'll need to know that you have submitted that to the child care center. Sometimes we just ask, we get a copy of it, or we just ask for evidence that you've sent it to the child care center. The same applies for operations and maintenance manuals. And there'll be a final, a final certificate whereby the child care center will accept the project and, and allow us to release the final payment. And at which point we will then ask you for a final release of liens. And none of that will happen until after obviously we have a final inspection. And I think that's it for me. So I am going to pass it on to my colleague, Lorena, who I've also been working with for eight years um, <laughs> on these construction projects. And she's gonna talk to you a little bit about labor and compliance. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, good afternoon. Again, my name is Lorena Garcia, Manager of Diversity and Labor Standards here at the EDA. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna give a just a very brief overview of labor compliance report, reporting in regards to affirmative action and prevailing wage. Um, just a side note that reporting to the EA is based on single source reporting, which means as a general contractor uh, for those, or prime contractor for those contracts or subcontracts that you award, uh, you must report to the EDA on behalf of all of those contracts that you have awarded. Each one of those subcontractors that you award, you must report to the EDA. If you're a prime contractor that is uh, award, awarded a construction contract to do, say, plumbing, and you need to subcontract to, let's say, an electrician, as the prime contractor, you will be responsible to report to the EDA for, for not only your contract, but for those subcontracts that you award. Next slide, please. So affirmative action. Um, affirmative action applies when a company has a total workforce of four or more employees for the entire company. Um, this includes the owner, administrative assistants, payroll personnel, and of course, those construction workers that work on the site. Uh, when that total workforce meet equals four or more, then affirmative action applies. Affirmative action is based on county goals per contract or per trade, and I have provided a, a list of the counties with their minority participation and women participation. Um, and it is based on uh, these goals uh, that you must meet. And if you cannot meet the goals, then you must in demonstrate that you have intended to meet the goals ba based on good faith efforts. Um, examples of good faith efforts are letters of refer referral letters, um, advertisements in local newspapers and outreach to unions or New Jersey Department of Labor's one-stop program. And I skipped over the affirmative action plan, um, which is the AA form, but I'm gonna discuss that now. Um, the affirmative action plan, uh, the AA form is due to the EDA prior to start of construction. Next slide, please. Um, here is a copy or a sample of the form one and the form two. The form one that I just explained is the document on the left. It is a one time, uh, one document, one time submission. And again, it is due at start of construction. Um, uh, and what it does is project the workers that you intend on work, at work uh, that you intend on hiring per trade for the periods of work that they start and stop. Um, again, 
I can't stress more that you must submit that form, which is your form one, your AA plan prior to prior to, to construction. Um, as an example for uh, affirmative action, if you are a contractor um, in, this, in the city of Trenton or the project is located in the city of Trenton and then within, within the county of Mercer, then your county goal would be 30% participation for minorities and then of course 6.9%. Um, 6.9% for women participation is statewide. So it really doesn't matter which county you are um, when you're hiring or looking to, to recruit or hire women, uh, worker trade workers, that goal or that target is 6.9%. The second document on this slide is the AA Form 2. This is also known as the monthly manning report. And the monthly manning report will list each subcontractor per trade with their minority and women uh, breakdown uh, participation for that month. Um, it is due by the 15th of the month following the work, uh, the work when the work started. For, so for instance, if you started work this month in the month of November, um, then by the 15th of the following month of December, in this, this case December, you would have to report to the EDA your AA participation for those contractors in those trades. And again, because of single source reporting as the general contractor, you would be responsible for reporting not only your work as the general contractor or prime contractor, but also list, to, list all subcontractors that have worked in that month and report to the EDA. Now, one thing that's listed on the form two are certified payrolls. I'm not gonna go too much into detail about um, how to complete a certified payroll, um, but submission of those are also due to the EDA. And I'll go through that here briefly. Um, within the next slides. Next slide, please. So prevailing wage. Prevailing wage are those rates that are, are to be paid to your employees based on a set wage determination that is issued by the EDA uh, and also based on uh, an issue based on the award of the contract. Only those weights, only those wages and the fringe benefits that are listed in that wage, wage determination are to be paid to the employees. Um, the wage determinations are due, are applicable for 24 months, um, and any there's nothing that pro prohibits the payment of more than the prevailing wage rate to any workman employed on the construction project. Certified payrolls, as I mentioned, are due to the EDA within 10 days of payment to the employees. Um, the good thing is that all. We have an affirmative action portal here at the EDA. So all documents, affirmative action and prevailing wage, including your certified payroll are submitted to the EDA, EDA by way of that AA portal. Next slide, please. So here's a sample of the affirmative, I mean, the, the certified payroll form is, was effective as of September, 2019. Um, by Department of Labor, this is the form that you must uh, must use. Now, I understand that some folks use they, 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 some folks use their uh, payroll uh, uh, companies such as ADP, which will generate a certified payroll based on that program. Um, that's great if it generates this form. If it's updated to use this form, um, this is the requirement per Department of Labor and per prevailing wage. Um, it, it is a two page document folks if some folks don't know the certified payroll is the first page, the second page is the statement of compliance, and both of these must be submitted to the EDA um, and uploaded to our and up to our into our portal. There's nothing that says that you cannot fill these forms out by hand. Um, by all means, if you want to, you know, download the documents or we have them on our website, you can do so. We'll go over the, the, these documents during uh, the pre-construction -con pre meeting that Kathleen mentioned um, in, detailed, uh, in detail later. Um, but like I said, you can fill these out anyway, but this is the form that you must, um, must use and submit to the EDA. Next slide, please. Uh, additional construct, uh, contractor training. Now, the good thing is, I know that this seems like it's a lot of information, and it and it it could be uh, uh, um, it could be daunting at times. But the good thing is that I have an amazing group of compliance officers that work here with me in the EDA um, that are very knowledgeable of this. We are going to provide a detailed contractor training in regards to the affirmative action documents, in regards to prevailing wage, what that means, some of the documents that Kathleen mentioned, as, such as the, the addendum to the contract, um, and, then some and then a closeout document at a later date, um, sometime in January 2023. Um, any questions that you have, again, please drop in the chat and we'll be happy to answer. Uh, and if, uh, and, um, 
and I'm going to pass it on. Uh, thank you, and I'm going to pass it on to or turn it over to Anna and Emily at DCF. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Smith. I am one of the assistant directors with the New Jersey Department of Children and Families, Office of Licensing, Child Care Licensing. Really long title, sorry. And, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Emily Gear, and I am a supervisor at the office. Uh, my primary Mary responsibility has to do with new centers, opening them or relocating them. So between the two of us, um, Anna is my uh, supervisor manager, and we both deal significantly in building life safety and environmental um, areas for centers, for childcare centers. That's why you get us. <laughs> and uh, I have actually been with the agency for 24 years now. Um, so we both have backgrounds in childcare centers. So um, hopefully we'll be able to help. Next slide, please. So the manual of requirements is promulgated pursuant to the Child Care Center Licensing Act. And I'm not sure if everybody can see me, but it really is that bright of a manual. So you don't miss us. Um, so, uh, and we have, I'm sorry, next slide, please. So um, as Emily was saying, she deals with the new centers and the eligibility for this program would be the centers that are already licensed, okay? So they already um, are under our authority to license them. They, are, they have to be caring for six or more children under 13 years of age for less than 24 hours a day. And we do both the physical facility and then the program requirements as well. My group focuses more on the building um, of, the, of the facility, but the plant physical plant facilities. Oh, next slide, please. And these are actually just the three um, focus, the three things we focus on with the new centers. Um, and again, I, I keep saying new, I'm sorry. I don't wanna complete confuse anyone. These are centers that we already licensed that are eligible for this program. So we look at the physical plant, we look at environmental and just general hip, health, safety and well being. And I think it's important too to recognize that prior to um, a center receiving a license being cleared, completing the application, that's why we keep saying new centers too, we have to have all the physical facility requirements in place, which include documents, things like a certificate of occupancy, a current fire certificate, and in, there's a lot of environmental documents as well that are required that will the contractors will not be dealing directly with those environmental documents. There's just some things that may we may need to update it environmental documents depending on what they do but that will not be their responsibility or something they need to worry about so it's interesting because all these three components are required technically before they even open a center or receive a license however they are also required to be maintained throughout their operating um, existence throughout the time that they are licensed um, so even though you know we did this to open them they need to maintain the require uh, the environmental documents current they need to maintain health and safety of the children. So that's why it's kind of like a give and take required before and throughout. And, uh, oh, next slide, please. So out of all these chapters, what we're gonna focus on is subchapter five, physical facility requirements. So in order to actually um, become licensed, they have to give us all the documents that uh, Emily was just speaking about. And then we would send out an, in, um, an inspector, child care quality assurance inspector, and they would then check to see if they're in at least substantial compliance so that they can um, operate. So as Emily was saying, there were um, there are forms like the certificate of occupancy um, that we deal with a lot. Um, we have to make sure that we're following the, uh, the New Jersey Uniform Construction Code. Sometimes we actually supersede that um, the biggest part of the, to remember about that is that if you are caring for children under two and a half years of age, they now have to be at the level of exit discharge. So they have to be able to evacuate immediately. At ground level. At, at a ground level. Um, whereas they could get a CO for a four-story building and state that the infants are gonna be on the fourth floor, but they can't um, as you know, the most stringent rule applies. Um, so the big thing 
that we do have is that people want to change their classrooms into um, rooms that are uh, conducive. conducive for the infants and toddlers. Um, sometimes it's impossible, um, not usually, but at a minimum, uh, you would, they would need, they may need a suppression system. They have to have doors that, you know, lead directly to the outside. So there's a, there, we won't get into detail with that. However, we do require that architectural plans are submitted. Um, and we actually do a review of that here. Most municipalities should require that as well when there's any type of a change of use. And change of use, um, an E is for education and they can care for children two and a half and older. And then an I-4, what's called now, uh, is caring for children under two and a half years of age. Um, so this chapter goes into all the physical requirements. Um, one of the improvements people might want to make is replacing or repairing you know, the, their playground equipment. So we um, go by the playground safety subcode equipment. Um, yeah, uh, layout and surfacing uh, by the public playground safety handbook. Um, so our inspectors do um, have to inspect the uh, equipment on the playground. Um, and for the most part, what we tell everyone is you know, you have to go with the manufacturer instructions for any furniture, equipment, supplies. Sometimes they are things that you could use at home, but they are not conducive for congregate care. So some things may say, um, you know, backyard use only or something like that. That they really, um, they usually talk to the inspectors before they buy anything big. Um, and we'll, I think we're talking about that a little later. Um, and then I think I'm just gonna let you. Okay, that's it, yep. Um, so as Anna said, if you go to the next slide, um, it kind of goes back through the environmental requirements. To, again, honestly, things that you will not have something to do with, but the center may be required to obtain would be what's called an RAO, which is an outdoor clearance. If a center decides to increase the space in their play area, because there's a minimum required of 350 square feet, which I think is good for like 10 children. If you have a center of 150 children you've grown, they may want to increase that size. That's perfect. The you know increase can be done, but then they need to get an environmentalist back to issue a new RAO. That is not something that the contractors could do. That is something that needs to be done by someone who is okay to do, is on the list, the approved list um, with the New Jersey DEP. So even though it may seem like everything can be done in one area, this is a multifaceted um, situation a lot of times, especially for big ticket items. Um, so interior, uh, there's something called a safe building in um, indoor air quality um, test. That's something, again, won't be handled if they increase space, if they go to an, another floor, they may need to get those tests. That's not something that the contractors need to worry about. That's something that will be on the center. Uh, same thing, water testing is required. That needs to be done by a certified lab. So when they increase space, when they put sinks in, if they do drinking fountains, that's all going to be something that could be installed by the construction, you know, the, the approved list for these uh, construction workers. However, then the center needs to take over and go to the next level. So just things to take into consideration. Uh, next slide. That's not that one. It's this one. Um, the biggest takeaway I think that we really want to focus on is um, when work is being completed. If, if they are indeed trying to renovate an entire room, um, take walls down, put walls up. If they want to install egresses or renovate a room that was not even a child care room in the center and that all this construction needs to happen. If they want to put brand new play, you know, like the, the greatest play equipment going, um, there's going to be things that are going to not be done while children are present in the building. And that's what we really need to focus on. Number one thing when a center's operating is always going to be the health, safety, and well-being of the children. Now, of course, that branches out in many directions, but that's the first question that needs to be asked. And I think the first person, the first line of defense is going to be the construction official, because whenever you're doing big ticket items, whenever it's going to be something that's going to change, um, 
in a manner where it's going to um, maybe interfere with or decrease the capacity of the op of the program as it's operating now. For example, renovating a room, the children can't use that room anymore, at the very least. So what are they going to do with these children? You know, they can't over occupy over other rooms. They can't just go and use space that's not pre-approved. So it kind of all ties together. But I think the biggest thing is to really look at, um, talk with the construction official. There's things you're not going to be able to do. You'll have to do it after hours. You'll have to do it on weekends. Children may not be able to be present. If a construction official thinks, okay, it's fine, it's not fine, the other line of defense is always going to be the center needs to check in with us, and they need to make sure we're okay with them operating during this, um, during construction. And a couple of things to think of um, would be if you need to turn off the water supply, if there's going to be um, no electricity, even if it's like, oh, for half hour, no electricity, no gas. These are major issues that a center cannot be operating without, okay? So they would actually need to figure out, come to us, figure out if we can, you know, find a way to relocate them or what needs to be done. Keep it in mind, um, construction equipment can never be accessible to children. So if you're working in one particular room, but you don't have room for all the construction supplies, putting a saw or even a ladder in a hallway that the children pass through or have access to is a huge liability issue, um, not only for the center and for the children, you know, for the children, but could be as well for the, the contractors. Um, and if I could just add, um, we have actually, conducted inspections because our inspections are surprise inspections mm -hmm. and have actually seen where the entire fire protective system has been down all day and will continue to be down and so you physically couldn't see them working because it was in a se different section of the building however um it impacted the absolutely. safety yeah the fire yeah. and we do see this quite often yeah um when and i know somebody so that is like the biggest the biggest thing I think is to take away is just the general health and safety. Um, there's going to be so, such a vast variety of what each center is going to do um, as far as the work they're asking for. I think as Anna mentioned, what we're really, really seeing a lot of questions coming through on our end has to do with suppression systems. A lot of people want to put suppression systems in. Um, it, sometimes it's just uh, to get the infants in to care for the younger children. Um, sometimes it's because they want to put, you know, additional levels. I had centers that want to go up three levels and even its EUs. So it's really situational uh, depending on the construction type of the building and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's a huge uh, question that has been coming up a lot for us prior to even mentioning this grant is how do we get this done? We really want to serve these younger children. Um, and the other issue that seems to come up a lot recently is going to be bollards. Um, we have really changed our view because there's just been such an evolution as to what is happening um, as far as cars going through not only playgrounds where children could potentially be out playing, um, but buildings even. Like, and it's not even just child care. We can give you child care examples where, thank goodness, the children weren't in, you know, that particular spot when a car has gone through. There's been quite a few instances. But I mean, if you look on the news, it goes through 7-Elevens. It goes through, like, even Wawa's have the, the bollards up. There's reasons for it. Um, and, and we can't pinpoint it exactly. It's just that things have changed. Drivers are distracted. There's a there's a lot more tension, a lot more stress um, involved with, um, you know, everybody in the world right now. And this has been going on for the past few years, even prior to COVID. We've been having some really uh, huge concerns and we've been really new centers. We've been really trying to get them to put the dollars in to begin with. Um, and we are really taking second looks at centers now and going, you really should have dollars. And it's expensive and it's not most, con well, it's not regulated. Bollards are not regulated by the um, UCC codes for child care centers. So we get a lot of pushback with it. But um, based on the health, safety and well-being, there are some situations where we are absolutely like, no, we cannot get around it. So this will be a huge help. Uh, and again, the construction, the local municipalities aren't a huge help with it because they're, you know, construction officials, construction workers go to um, the township and they're like, we don't regulate them. We don't have, you know, so 
It, uh, definitely. And, and then the opposite of that, we have actually had a couple of times where they did get involved and wanted very, <laughs> very strict requirements. So again, stricter rule applies. Yeah, a lot of a lot of local municipalities, and although they have one big regs, you know, rules through construction codes to go by, there are some differences in how they're perceived or how they're, you know, go down to us. So um, we try to get the most strictest um, in play, and it's it, of course it's helpful when the construction officials are with us, um, but it's not always the case. Um, so those are probably that, and climbing equipment and playgrounds. I think those are going to be the big ticket items. Um, but it could surprise us, who knows, <laughs> as far as um, what would need to be done. And then any little, like the furniture, the equipment like that, that needs to be put in. Of course, that wouldn't necessarily be regulated by um, the construction, uh, you know, the, the workers here. It's going to be the center getting the correct equipment, but it may go down to they need it um, to be stabilized. They need it to be um, bolted to the walls, to the floors, things like that. And that might be something that may or may not need, um, they may or may not need assistance with. But we also wanted to get across that the, the centers, we work with them. I mean, we're the regulators of the manual. We don't make the manual. We don't, we don't write the rules. We don't, these, these are laws. Like the, it, to, be late, to be a licensed childcare center, you have to meet the requirements in the manual. We don't change the, you know, have anything to do essentially with getting those laws in, but we do, we are the person out there, people out there enforcing them, well, regulating them. Um, our goals are to work with the centers and do what we can to bring them to compliance, to get them in um, a safe area with the children. But in the end, it, so we do partner with them, but in the end, it is solely going to be the center's responsibility. We work directly with them. If they are renting a place, if they are leasing a place, we don't work with landlords. We don't work with the people who are in the building. Our contract, if you will, our license is with the actual sponsors who we call owners of that program. And it is their responsibility and they are aware. Um, if as much as they can come to us, go to their inspectors. The center needs to go to their inspectors if they have any questions at all. Climbing equipment, I know Anna had mentioned at one point that you know there's certain pieces of equipment that don't meet the standards. If you see a, a swing set that you could typically see in someone's backyard, that is a true sign. It cannot be on the um, playground for a child care center. So we encourage um, centers all the time, please contact us before you buy big ticket items. Um, just like we do with the architectural plans. It, they're expensive and we get it, but it is so much easier to fix something if we see that plan ahead of time and approve it than to, in the end, turn around and, and surprise, oh, we have a new room, come look at it, we want to put infants here. And we walk in and go, there, there's no way you can get infants here. It, we don't like that surprise factor. So we try to communicate constantly, reach out to us, let us know because we will work with you and we will get um, your goals accomplished, but before you make them, you know, in the correct way, in, in the way that meets the requirements. Um, last page basically has to do with um, questions, which you're not asking us, you're putting them on the little chat. Um, but it also has Anna's contact information as well as ours. I don't know if it went on there. Okay. All right, so um, of course, Anna and I, um, like we said, we're, we're the life safety. We kind of, um, her whole unit, her whole team really deals with life safety, with building. Um, and of course, we will answer any questions as necessary if you wanna shoot an email to us or whatever, um, but let the center start with reaching out to the inspectors. We will be talking to our inspectors, our team, and letting them know that th this is coming and that any questions, of course, they have that they have concerns with or are not quite sure, they always bring back to their supervisors and or um, our area, our life safety area. I think that's about it. Thank I think you. I'm, I'm here to close us out. Um, I just want to thank you so much, uh, Anna and Emily and Lorena and Kathleen. Um, the complexity of this program is not lost on us. Um, this is new terrain for certainly the child care centers um, in many cases. And I, I wanted to just sort of make a couple of closing comments. Um, one is uh, just to share sort of personally, um, I talk about this whenever I talk about this program. I have two little kids. Um, they're both in public school now, but actually the school is closed this week. So they're at the 
they're doing like a vacation program this week at the early childhood center um, that they went to, the preschool they went to since they were infants. And I hadn't been inside there since COVID. And I went in um, yesterday to pick them up. And, and first of all, they look, they look giant next to the like tiny chairs and toilets and everything. But um, I was walking through there and I was really struck by how all the best practices that you read about in terms of quality childhood environments were present there. They had natural light. They have these beautiful playgrounds, the windows open, the doors, they could, you know, the kids could go everywhere. There's ramps, there's elevators. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Um, it's great that my kids got to go there. I'm thrilled they went there. I think it's part of why they're thriving, but it's also fundamentally inequitable that my kids got to go somewhere like that with all these elements that are what we believe to be the best the best in the world for what young children need. Um, and they were able to go there because I was able to pay the expensive tuition and because of the zip code that I live in and the color of my skin and all of these other factors. And so we really um, are committed. And this is something that Governor Murphy talks about all the time on improving the quality of childcare for all New Jersey kids. And so um, what all of you are doing and your um, the response we've heard from the contractor community since we announced this grant availability has been very um, moving. Um, I know we've put in the chat, one of the things I saw come up uh, several times was how do I get involved or how do I let childcare providers know that I'm interested in doing this? We have a form you can fill out. Um, we've had um, a couple hundred contractors already complete the form and say, hey, I would love to, to be involved in this. And part of what's been heartwarming has been reading the comments that have come with them because what folks have been saying, and this may resonate with some of you on this call is, um, you know, we're a family owned business or where we're rooted in our community. We have children. We want to help improve the quality, you know, bring our expertise to improve the quality of child care for our others in our community, our neighbors, our friends, our family members. Um, and so that is also um, something that I hope resonates with, with all of you that with the complexities here and certainly our colleagues at DCF talking about, you know, the law and the, you know, most pressing need for, for the children to be safe during this kind of construction. You know, just thinking about the legacy that you'll be leaving by helping to improve these environments for for the youngest New Jerseyans, it's pretty powerful. So, um, really grateful for everyone's uh, participation and attendance. Um, I, I definitely uh, missed one of my key talking points at the beginning, which is I want to um, make sure you know that our applications for this program open next week, next Tuesday, the fifteenth. That's when we begin accepting applications from childcare centers we are accepting them on a rolling basis. So it's not like it closes that day and you missed the window. Um, there were some questions in the q and I saw about like who applies and how does it work? Essentially the child care center has to apply to us with, um, they need to be eligible and there are a number of criteria that they have to meet, but then they say, here's what we want to do. And here's the project we want to pursue and the eligible uses. And that needs to be supported by quotes for, or at least one quote from a registered public works contractor. So if they were to just submit and say, hey, we want to rip our playground and they had no quote from a contractor, their application cannot advance. So we are encouraging centers to work with contractors. That's part why we have this contractor, um, interested contractor list um, to identify what they would wanna do, scope it out, look at what the potential costs would be and then have that be um, something that can get the application moving through our system. Um, we put it in the chat several times, but there is a website on the EDA webpage that has just an, sort of staggering amount of resources and details um, that I would encourage you to look at and visit. We have a frequently asked questions that is up to, uh, are we over a hundred questions now? Oh, well over 107 questions. So some of what you've asked um, and so what you're putting in that the responses is drawn directly from that. We are updating that. So please continue to look at that. Um, we also, um, will be, this is being recorded and we will post the materials on our website in the next uh, several days. Um, and, uh, and I know there were some questions about the timeline and I wanted to just uh, clarify that essentially the, there's a, it's gonna take a while for everything to work through our system because of the complexity of what's 
required. So we need to first approve the child care provider, then we need to approve the project, then we need to approve the contractor, and we need to approve the cost reasonableness of that and all of these, these different stages. So this is not, we are working to do it as quickly and efficiently as we can, but this is not like they apply on November 15th and they get approved on November 30th. This is going to take some time to work through our system. Um, and as I said, we are, the funding that we have, um, that we have put out is the first uh, tranche of funding that we have available, but we have over, we've close to $100 million to support the child care sector in New Jersey with facility improvements. So we are very grateful um, for all of you. And, and I just want to thank all of my amazing colleagues for their expertise and partnership in building out this program. Um, and I know there's a few more questions. Um, and so if, if if folks want to um, stay on the, the chat, we can have folks answer those as well. Um, and again, just thank you and, and really appreciate the partnership. All right, I do want to ask real quick if um, anybody is answering questions, I don't want to cut you off. But um, I am going to end the webinar unless there's any objections from staff. Everybody knows how they can follow up. Really appreciate everyone's time today. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. you.